Hi everyone. Ugh. Forgot to shave. I'll be right back. Hi everyone. Welcome to worship. We have the election coming up this week, so I'm going to go ahead and pray for that, and then we'll join together in our Lord's Prayer. Please join me. Uh, dear Lord, uh, we just pray for the upcoming election. Uh, we don't know how it's going to turn out. Uh, we don't know how much of a hand you play in it. Uh, but Lord, we know one thing. We know that you sit on the throne. Um, Lord, we also just ask uh, that your will be done, not only in this election, but also in each of our own lives. We pray that we would be choosing to listen to your voice uh, rather than the voices of others. Uh, so in your name we pray. Amen. And now, please join me in our Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. The story of human and life and the two trees in the center of the Garden of Delight is our story. Uh, we have a choice between two trees, we have a choice between two voices that we can listen to, and we have a choice between life and death, between God's good and our good. But uh, we have a habit of picking the wrong tree. After all, this is our story. But what actually happens when we pick the wrong tree? In this story, God tells them, You must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat from it, you will certainly die. But let's be honest, uh, when we eat from the wrong tree, right? Like when we listen to the wrong voice and we do what is good in our own eyes, well, we don't die. 
Uh, and actually, when Adam and Eve eat, uh, ate from the tree, they didn't die either. Uh, I mean, like, they went on to die eventually. Now, everyone who came after that would die eventually. A couple of chapters later, there's this genealogy, and, and as the Bible tells it, the, the people, they seem to live a long time, but they all died. Uh, so Adam, uh, he lived 130 years, he had Seth, and then he lived some 800 more years. So Adam lived 930 years, and then he died. And, and Seth, well, he lived 912 years, and then he died. Then Enosh lived, and then he died. Kenan lived, and then he died. And, and on and on and on, but they all died. So, uh, if this is our story, well, well, then I guess this means that our story is about how our choosing the wrong tree and the wrong voice is slowly killing us. Like, like we're destined to die for this choice that we have made, uh, but it's going to be a bit delayed. We're going to have to wait and wait and wait some more. Uh, if this is our story, that then God is saying to us, uh, you must not eat from that tree, right? You must not determine what is good on your own, but you must depend on me and listen to my voice and listen to what I say is good. For when you eat from it, when you eat from that tree, you will certainly die eventually. Now, I'll be honest, uh, if this is our story, then I don't see much reason to change what voice I'm listening to. Uh, I'm pretty much already sold on the idea that one day I will die. And, and because of Jesus, I'm convinced that, well, death won't be the end, but, but that there will come life afterwards. And, and so in the meantime, I might as well enjoy this life, right? I might as well eat from whatever trees look good and tasty. It might kill me one day, but I don't really think changing which voice I'm listening to will change that outcome. And maybe, just maybe, uh, you're having those same thoughts right now. Or you've had those thoughts in the past, or, or maybe you're going to have those thoughts one day. Uh, it's the same question that we were asking maybe a month ago. What's in it for me? Uh, like, what reason do I actually have to listen to and obey God's voice? Does it make any actual difference whether we listen or not? Like, like, if I'm just going to die one day anyways, uh, and if I'm still going to go to whatever and wherever I think heaven is either way, uh, well, well, then what actual difference does it make? Right? Like, this is our story and this is our question. What's in it for me? And, and at the same time, though, like, uh, we all have people that we care about more than just ourselves. Right? None of us are that selfish. Uh, and, and so it's not just what's in it for me. It, it's also, well, what's in it for those around me? Uh, what's in it for those I love and care about? What's in it for my family? Uh, does the tree that I, right, me, myself, and I, does the tree that I choose have any impact on my family? Uh, does the voice that I listen to make a, a difference in the lives of my friends. And, and you know what? Maybe Jesus has been working on our hearts, and so maybe our sphere of caring goes beyond just our people and our immediate relationships. Uh, maybe we even care uh, about the whole world, right? So it's like, what's in it for everyone? Uh, or, or all living creatures, like, like the animals? Or, or what about just all of creation? How does the tree and the voice that I choose impact any and, and all of these, myself included? That's the question we're asking today. Uh, but instead of focusing on the right tree, we're going to focus on what happens when we choose the wrong tree. right? The one that God warns us not to choose and the one that we choose anyways. So, what actually happens when we pick the wrong tree? Is it just a slow death? Like, like, is that what the text says? Well, what the text says is this. When you eat from it, you will certainly die. Now, when you hear that, what are you expecting? Right? When you eat from it, you will certainly die. Are, are you expecting Adam and Eve to eat from it and to die hundreds of years later? Uh, or are you expecting Adam and Eve to die the moment the fruit hits their stomachs? Uh, and, and, like, I know that you've heard this story 
who knows how many times, but just try to forget what actually happens and just tell me what you would expect to happen based on what it says. Right, let's be honest, the, the way our Bibles say it, it almost seems like the death should happen right away. But we need to remember that we are reading a translation of the original Hebrew text. So let's pause and look at the Hebrew and what does that say? Uh, I mean, pretty much it says this, it says, For in the day that you eat of it, surely you shall die. I'll repeat that in case you missed it. It says, for in the day that you eat of it, surely you shall die. And now, suddenly, we have a problem. Uh, because when it just said when you eat from it, it, it was ambiguous. But, but now it says in the day. And it seems pretty clear. And in the day that they ate from it, well, well did they die? No, like that was hundreds of years later. And so then that means that God, right, God uh, is who told them that they would die that day. Well, that means that God is a bold-faced liar. <gasps> or, you know, maybe we're just missing something. So uh, God says in that day. So what does happen that day? Well, for one, uh, there is a ton of brokenness. A lot of the good of creation, well, it just starts to fall apart. Let's start with that first thing that happens. Uh, it says, uh, okay, so the two of them eat the fruit. And then, then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Now, previously, we were told that Adam and his wife were both naked, and they felt no shame. And now suddenly, they're, they're covering up their nakedness as if they are ashamed. Uh, this is this presumably good thing in God's eyes ha has now become not good uh, in the eyes of humans. So, so God's goodness, rather than being a blessing, ha has now become a burden and a source of shame. Uh, and it's not just a source of shame, but also a source of fear. Uh, because, well, God shows back up and then the humans hide. And then God asks, where are you? And Adam, hiding behind a tree, well, he answers... I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. I mean, like, obviously Adam is burying the lead here. Uh, obviously Adam must be hiding in part because he did something he wasn't supposed to do, right? eating from the wrong tree. And, and Adam doesn't want to mention that to God who told him to do that. But, but at the same time, perhaps Adam is afraid of his own nakedness. Right After all, he covered it up before trying to hide. So how could something so good become something to fear? And so since this is our story, well, well it is the story of how we take something that God has called good and, and we become ashamed and afraid of it. Uh, like there, there are pieces of us, pieces that make us who we are, that, that we want to keep hidden inside. Parts of us that, that we don't want to show the world. Uh, God put them inside of us, but we become embarrassed by them. We don't want others to see. Maybe it's a special passion or a special talent that we're afraid to show others. Uh, because, because we're afraid of what they might think or, or say, or, or we're afraid of how they might treat us. Like, like think of an artist or a musician, or maybe you are one. Uh, well, they might have a special talent creating beautiful portraits and melodies, uh, but they keep it hidden because they do not want to put themselves out there like that. Right? To get up on that stage in front of an audience is to expose yourself. You feel naked up there alone, and you're afraid. But God has said that your talent is good. God has said that your talent is meant to bless that audience and meant to bless this world. God says to trust his voice, not, not your own voice. And then you will see as God sees. And, and it isn't just with our talents and passions. It's, it's, with, it's with our own very selves. Like we're afraid of being naked and exposed and vulnerable. We're, we're afraid of being intimate with God and with others. We'd rather hide than show people our true selves. Like we would rather sow leaves together and cover over our flaws than risk rejection. But, but when we do this, well, the consequence is way worse than the risk. 
Uh, this one book I like, it's called The Cure. It talks about this as wearing a mask. And, and so it's like we're all tempted to wear masks for a variety of reasons. Maybe we want to prove to others or, or even to ourselves that we're worthy of being loved. Or maybe we just don't want others to feel sorry for us or, or we want them to see us as great. Or we just fear that if others see us truly, they won't want to know us. But then the book says, No one told me that when I wear a mask, only my mask receives love. We can gain admiration and respect from behind a mask. We can even intimidate. But as long as we're behind a mask, any mask, we will not be able to, be, we will not be able to receive love. Then, in our desperation to be loved, we'll rush to fashion more masks, hoping the next will give us what we're longing for, to be known, accepted, trusted, and loved. So God, well, he warns us not to look with our own eyes, but to trust God's eyes. Because in God's eyes, well, we are worthy of love, flaws and all. And when we listen to God's voice rather than our own, then, then we can live naked and vulnerable and free. Like we can be truly known. We can be truly understood. We can be truly loved. But if we do not listen to God's voice, and if we see with our own eyes and eat from that tree, well, those masks will go right back up. And then suddenly I'm missing out on all of that. And suddenly those around me are missing out on me. And that actually brings us to, to a whole other realm of brokenness. Broken relationships. And take any pick of them. There's, there's a ton in the text. Uh, like, for instance, you have the relationship between the two humans, which turned sour pretty quick. Right? They just got married. Uh... But now here, like first the two humans, they're covering themselves to hide their good nakedness from one another, right? They're already putting up walls to protect themselves. And then the next, you have them playing the blame game. Uh, the man said, the woman you put here with me, well, she gave me some fruit from the tree and I ate it. Uh, like Adam, he'll do whatever it takes to get the focus off of himself, even if it comes at the expense of his wife. And like, isn't this our story too? Uh, because we mess up and we screw up, but, but then we think it would be good for us to not take the full brunt of the blame. Uh, we think it would be good if someone else shared the blame with us or, or perhaps even took more of it. We throw people under the bus. Uh, like as children, we blame our siblings. And then as teenagers, well, we want our school friends to get in trouble too. And, and then as adults, we'll, we'll try to find some way, any way, to not have to say, I'm sorry, I was wrong. Like, even if that is ultimately what, what would be best for the relationship. And it's not just about trying to avoid blame. Uh, even when things are going good, that there is some added tension in any relationship that's just hard to put a finger on. So, so for instance, God, he told the woman, your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. And maybe, hey, maybe that's just speaking about the way that society has been for thousands of years, where women have been taken advantage of and treated as property and have lacked power and agency. Maybe it's that, and maybe it's something else. Maybe it's also that that phrase is speaking about how when a person likes another person, like when they have desire for them, well, then suddenly that, that person who they desire now has a certain power over them a power that they can use for good or a power that they can misuse and abuse and, and end up harming the other person. Like when we like someone romantically or, or even just as a friend, well, like we find ourselves in a vulnerable position, naked and vulnerable. Uh, we find ourselves at their mercy with, with no guarantee on whose voice that other person will listen to. Or what about our relationships with the rest of creation? Uh, so one way of reading the story is, is to see the snake in the garden as a representative of, of all animals. And so when God curses the snake and puts enmity between the snake and the woman and between their offspring, well, you might wonder if all animals suffer from this curse. Or, or maybe it isn't this curse, but then at the same time, uh, you see a couple stories down the line, one of 
Adam's and Eve's descendants, Noah, well, he's told by God, the fear and dread of you will fall on all the beasts of the earth and on all the birds in the sky and on every creature that moves along the ground and on all the fish of the sea. And for any animal lover out there, well, like they have to weep at this. Like they, they read it and they wonder, oh, what could have been? Like wrestling with lions and racing zebras and tea parties with bears. But, but like how is this our story? But, but then you look around and, and it's like, well, should animals be afraid of humans? Like, like are humans out to get them or, or, or like are they safe? Like do we create more fear today? But we also have childbearing getting messed up. It would seem that there may have been some pain before, but post-tree, God says, I will make your pains in childbearing very severe. With painful labor, you will give birth to children. Now, I don't know what, what childbirth was like before, nor will I ever truly know what it is like now, obviously. Uh, but isn't this our story today? Like, like, we have certain things that we're supposed to avoid to protect our babies. Like, no drugs or alcohol, no, no water slides or roller coasters. Uh, we make choices that impact our babies. And we make choices that impact our children. Like, to say the pain of childbearing stops at giving birth would be a lie. Because the whole journey of parenting is difficult. But it can be made more difficult and more painful if we choose to listen to the wrong voices. Like, we create more pain for ourselves. This is our story. Or, or how about Adam? Uh, to Adam, God says, Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil you will eat food from it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow you will eat. Uh, so, so back at the beginning of this story, well, God, he places the man in the garden to work the ground, to join God in cultivating it and bringing goodness out of it. Like it was the human's job or, or role in creation. But now that, that job and that role, well, it's been messed up. It's been made more difficult. It, it becomes less rewarding, less fulfilling. Actually, back in Genesis 1, uh, God gives the humans some other rules. So, so God, he creates them to be in his own image to be his representatives, and specifically, God told them to be fruitful in number, to fill the earth, and God also told them to subdue the earth. Specifically, he said, to rule over the fish and the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. So, so the picture that the Bible is creating here is one in which the humans are God's representatives here on earth, and as God's representatives, they're going to join God in the act of creation. Meaning they're going to join God in bringing order to creation and in bringing goodness out of creation. Right? They're going to make more people. Uh, they're going to take care of the animals. And they're going to work the ground. Uh, this, this is just part of what they were made for. To, uh, to partner with God in loving and caring for and enjoying and, and bringing goodness out of creation. Which has so much potential for goodness. Except then we see, one by one, uh, these purposes and roles, well, they get all messed up. Childbearing gets screwed up. Uh, our relationship with animals, well, it hits a barrier. And now our, our good job of working the ground becomes burdensome. And isn't this our story? Like, like how many of us have worked or, or are working a job where the work feels unfulfilling? Like that job, it's, it's going to be hard work no matter what, right? Work in the ground. But, but that work becomes extra burdensome and then more painful and less fulfilling if we're listening to the wrong voice. Like does God care whether our jobs are fulfilling or not? Or, or like are our jobs part of? of God's plan for us? Like what if our jobs are part of that process of creation? Like of bringing goodness out of the potential of this good creation? And what if we can find again that fulfillment by listening to God's voice?
Now, I have a little bit left to go, but I'm actually going to stop here for today. Uh, now, this brokenness, be it the brokenness of our self-image and our ability to be intimate with others, right? The difficulty of truly being and showing ourselves, the, the inability to remove the masks that we fashion for ourselves, or be it the brokenness of our relationships with other humans, including our loved ones, even including our spouses, or be it the brokenness of our relationship with the rest of creation, of how we cannot have tea parties with bears, and how the whole parenting journey is filled with immense pain, and, and how things which we were made to do, including our jobs and the ways in which we partner with God and bring in goodness out of creation, how, how it all can end up being so unfulfilling. Like this brokenness, it comes about because of our sin. It's a consequence of doing those things we shouldn't do. It's a consequence of listening to the wrong voice and choosing the wrong tree. It's a consequence of choosing to see with our own eyes, to, to determine good for ourselves rather than submitting to God's wisdom and allowing God to see and determine what is truly good. It's a consequence of refusing to live under God's wisdom and refusing to live under God's rule and reign and refusing to let God sit on the throne of our lives. This is our story. And the decisions and the choices that we make in our story, well, the decisions and choices that I make in my story, well, they impact me and they impact those around me and they impact my loved ones and they impact all of creation. So, two questions I'm going to leave you with. The first is a precursor for next week. So God says, For in the day that you eat of it, surely you shall die. So, is all this brokenness we talked about the death told about? Or, is there something more? And the second question I leave you with, uh, all this brokenness that, that comes about from not listening to God's voice, uh, all this brokenness that impacts not only you, but those around you, is this enough reason to start listening? Is this enough reason to, to stop eating from the trees that God warns us not to eat from?
who or what is sitting on the throne at the center of your life? Like whose voice have you been listening to? Uh, what choice have you been making? And what choice will you make next? May you, as you go through your week, find reasons to reflect on the decisions you make, the voices you listen to, and the results that come from them. And may you, as, as you go about your life, may you find reasons to obey God's voice, uh, to let God do the seeing, and to listen to what God says is truly good. May you not do what is right in your own eyes, but instead turn your eyes to Jesus and do as he says. And in doing so, may you and me, may all of us together find life and find it to the full. Amen. Jesus is waiting, God so loved the world.